Young woman who I greatly respect, uh, Rochelle Brown. She is a historian, librarian, and activist. Since 2001, she's been involved in grassroots activism on a variety of environmental justice issues, including mountaintop removal, coal mining, hydraulic frac fra fracturing, and the sitting, siting, and regulation of energy infrastructure. Her essay, Power Line, Memory, and the March on Blair Mountain, will be published early next year in the edited volume, Excavating Memory, Material Cultural Approaches to Sites of Remembering and Forgetting. She enjoys hearing and recording people's stories and is currently planning a listening project in Western Maryland. Please welcome Rochelle Brown. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you, Tom. That's really tough to follow. Um, my father, who uh, was in Vietnam and who actually uh, was decorated by the Republic of South Vietnam, Vietnam and had those decorations until they were stolen in a move, uh, is fond of saying that some people run away from gunfire and some people run toward it. And uh, it sounds like Tom is one of those people who runs toward it. But I'm going to try and follow that. Um, rickety. I'm a military brat. My father was a career army officer. This meant that we moved from North Carolina, where I was born, to Kansas, Tidewater, Virginia, Hawaii, and then the DC suburbs of Northern Virginia. When people ask me where I'm from, meaning where I grew up, the area that shaped me, I often say the DC area, which is true enough because I spent half the time there between my birth and my 18th birthday and have been there pretty much ever since. But I am also tempted to say that I'm from the military although that confuses people who are likely to think I mean I was in uniform at some point. I was born in a military hospital, on a military installation, a place that belongs to the entity called the federal government, more specifically the Department of Defense, which like all organizations, large organizations, bureaucratic organizations, has a headquarters but no home. The military decided where my family was going to live and more than once provided the generally quite shabby housing there. And even though my father retired when I was a young teenager and I went to only one middle and high school, we continued to move for various reasons. It was not an upbringing that encouraged attachment to any particular place. Home meant the built environment, which is indeed an aspect of place, but it pretty much stopped there for me. We weren't in any one location long enough for it to distinguish itself for me. Though both my parents grew up spending a lot of time outdoors, my mother in Prescott in the mountains of central Arizona, my father in the mountains of North Georgia, they both worked full time, and the other people who cared for and educated me did not put any particular emphasis on teaching me to notice the things that would cultivate a special sense of place. This is not unusual in the time and area in which I grew up. In college, though, I began to spend more time outdoors and eventually found my way into volunteer work on the Appalachian Trail in Virginia. It was here that the pattern reversed for me. The archetypal journey on the Appalachian Trail is the exalted through hike, all 2,160 miles as the trail currently exists, generally hiked south to north, following the spring from Springer Mountain in North Georgia to Katahdin in Maine. And yet only a minority of people who get on the trail attempt it, and even fewer accomplish it. Many are on day hikes, overnight trips, or section hikes. But still, much of the lore of the trail is entwined with the romance of the through hiker. Like all trails, the Appalachian Trail is understood to go somewhere with an additional dash of the epic journey thrown in. But I use the trail to stay put. In trail building and maintenance work, I have gone over short stretches of the Appalachian Trail and side trails in Shenandoah National Park repeatedly. I became familiar with Shenandoah Greenstone, the result of a lava flow that underwent an unusual process of metamorphosis that made it not only colorful but also quite hard. Drive a tool like a pigmatic directly into some greenstone and usually all you'll get is the energy reflected back through the handle in a jolt that vibrates unpleasantly through the joints of your fingers and arms. The trail crews I worked on also assisted on popular trails elsewhere in the park that are not part of the Appalachian Trail system. I passed several week-long trips on Old Rag Mountain, a billion-year-old granite monadnock that abuts the Shenandoah Mountains, which are about half its age. 
I have probably dug, scratched, and smooth tread on nearly every foot of the trails below the tree line on Old Rag Mountain. A few years after I started doing trail work, I got a copy of Newcomb's Fla uh, Wildflower Guide and began looking in a new way. At someone's suggestion, whenever I identify a new flower for the first time, I write down the date and location near its picture in the book. Some of the plants I identified for the first time in the spring of 2007, the first time I took Newcombs out on the trail, include the Canada Violet, Lettuce Saxifrage, Small Flower Crowfoot, Wild Geranium, and Great Chickweed. And since we often spent the first or second week in May in the same areas, I could look forward to patches where pink lady slippers and trilliums blossomed in their dozens. The portion of the Appalachian Trail which I maintained was, being at a different elevation, not so good for wildflower spotting, but I developed a companionable acquaintance with it. It runs along the spine of the south peak of Mount Marshall, with a view from the main overlook to the east in the Shenandoah Valley and down on a little hamlet called Brown Town. I began to think of it as my mountain, not in a proprietary sense, but in terms of my bond with it, as in my sibling or my parent. I didn't become as intimately familiar with the mountain as I might have if I had lived on it or even spent several contiguous days at a time. But I did register the change in vegetation along the change in elevation, the short path to the overlook surrounded by mountain laurel, and the maples at the overlook itself. I also know that at least one bear frequented the trail. I never saw him or her, although I have been within a few yards of bears in other parts of the park. But the bear, whom I named Marshall, did flip over rocks that lined the water bars. Those are the ditches that run at roughly 45 degree angles downhill across the trail to channel water off the tread. I was looking for grubs and other tasty tidbits. Marshall also pooped on the trail. So my brief time in the mountains gave me a sense of connection to a place and also taught me a new way of looking. I now get acquainted with new places by looking at topography, the way water moves across it, the plants and animals that I can identify who live there and when they are active. When I was in graduate school at the University of Maryland, I walked nearly every day one spring, summer, and autumn along Paint, Paint Branch Trail, which runs along the tributary of the Anacostia River. When I started in the spring, delicate white bloodroot was blooming. In the hottest days of August, a patch of brilliant crimson cardinal flowers, a favorite nectar plant of black swallowtail butterflies, blossomed for several days next to a dip in the trail that never quite drained completely. When a few years ago, I chanced upon the movement against mountaintop removal coal mining, I found my initial way into it through my time on the trails in the Shenandoah Mountains. I'm still not quite sure what makes mountain vistas so appealing, but I suspect that, for me at least, part of it is the sense of knowing that I'm in the presence of something that operates on a time scale incomprehensible to me. I know that mountains are not permanent, but the Appalachian Mountains have certainly changed relatively little in the time humans have been on the earth. And while I can stand on the overlook on South Mount Marshall and see for miles, I know there are interactions of astonishing complexity going on in spaces humans would measure in feet and inches, or are below our ability to see with unaided sight. So I was aghast at the thought it could all be wiped out in the course of a few months or years for something as ephemeral, for some coal to burn. As I said, this was my way in. But as I am also fond of saying, I came for the mountains and I stayed for the people. I knew intrinsically that each place is worthwhile on its own terms, but this sense is general. I come to appreciate places in particular through other people's understanding of them. They designate them. The places must be established before they can be given meaning by those who care for them. They know them as I do not. They hold fast to them and defend them in the face of threats and sometimes acts of violence, ostracism, community conflict, and the constant invitation to despair. They do not give up on them. This is not to disparage those who feel they must concede and seek life elsewhere. They have done what they needed to, often for the preservation of their own and their loved ones' health and livelihoods. I know it is rarely an easy decision. I feel I work on their behalf, too, honor their loss and their exile. But I could not do so, could not hold fast to this path without those who remain, who stand defiantly in place, in the places that matter to them. 
These places do not have to be pastoral retreats, places of rushing water, burbling springs, rippling grass on meadows, dramatic mountain vistas, although they cer certainly can be. They do not have to meet any tests of purity or pristineness. Sometimes those who seek to prevent the kind of harm I also oppose inhabit and use those places in ways that are difficult for me to comprehend or even troubling to me. And people can have ambiguous relationships with place. They may have been productive of cares and disappointments and sites of trauma. They are rarely locales of ease and abundance. In fact, remaining in place is often hard work. It requires planning, upkeep, repair, shepherding and safeguarding of resources. Thus the depredations of absentee landowners and people who are transient because they alight, use up, and move on. It is not a question of property rights and resale value, although these are necessary considerations in a society in which one must generally have recourse to the marketplace to fulfill needs and desires. It's something in addition to that. A patch of ground that is an abode, a repository of memories, and a source of strength can also bear poisons. But although I fight harm and damage, if they have been done, I do not accept that these places are beyond redemption. Soiled, spoiled places that warrant no further effort, that are best abandoned to further abuses. Places like Curtis Bay, the Anacostia River in DC, the coal mines and gas wells, both active and abandoned in Appalachia, the industrial sites and toxic waste dumps located in rural areas, where people are assumed to be quiescent, even grateful, in the face of incursions by large and different entities, including, I might add, the federal government. My fellow activists and I are frequently tagged with the epithet of outside agitator. We wander around spoiling for the next big fight. We stir up trouble, acting on strange, sinister motives, sometimes said to be a sheer antipathy for order, stability, and tranquility. It's a familiar rhetorical tool of powerful people, disingenuous and underhanded. It also implicitly casts aspersions on the community members who are already there, already fighting, because they are always the first to resist. It is true that we have a responsibility to act with care, sensitive to the dynamics of the communities in which we work, being fully aware and mindful of the potential consequences of our actions, avoiding believing ourselves saviors, and hearing the loudest, most powerful voices say repeatedly that we are unwelcome can take its toll. But when people say, thank you for caring about our mountains, when they say, we felt so alone, like nobody cared what happened to us, and those are both things that have been said to me personally. I have a blank spot on the page because I really have no words for that. I haven't yet developed the deep bonds with a place or places that result from extended, daily mindful observance and interaction. But some do stand out as special for me, for the significant experiences, even the unpleasant or traumatic ones, that I've had there in trying to prevent harm to them. And I haven't been alone. Thank you.